Elvis Presley and, and so on. And those are all white guys. But the first teen idol for a- African Americans was Johnny Ace. And he had all these great songs. And, and, but he died. It was bad timing. He died in 54. Okay. Okay. The, the world broke open for uh, rock and roll in 56. And by that time, everybody forgot about him. So I, I always make the point, if it, there's anybody that should be in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, it's Johnny Ace. Let's go back and speak with Gary. Now, Gary, given his commercial success, how do we look at Johnny Ace today? Um, was he really influential at the time? You know, as far as his influences go, you know, you're talking about his death in 1954. And I guess we would look at him as a historian as more of a transitional piece. Because, as I said, when you listen to the Blues Shouters or Big Mama Thornton or Muddy Waters' Howlin' Wolf, uh, go through the list. And his style was completely different. He was completely different from the Delta, even though he you know, lived very close to the Delta himself. He developed a style in which he was more a great romantic singer and not someone who was just a shouter. I think he took that edge, but he made himself, by his choices, I think he made himself much more acceptable to wide audiences. And I think that if he lived, then he would have been much more successful, especially with wide audiences. you got to remember, as we all do, that when you're talking about the early 1950s, we're talking about what was referred to as race records versus everyday records. And Jerry Wexler from Atlantic came up with the idea of changing race records to rhythm and blues, R&B. And that category fits Johnny Ace. I mean, he sat down behind a piano, he played, he sang, he had a little stage fright, but sometimes he would fire his pianist and he would sit behind the piano to sort of give him a little bit more comfort. But as far as his influences go, I mean, when I listen to Johnny Ace, I don't hear Charlie Patton. I don't hear Sun House. I don't hear Robert Johnson. But still, the development of his style, like Johnson's on the guitar, was revolutionary at the time. Different from Little Richard, who came out in the same year in, uh, Saint, in well, in uh, New Orleans. But Johnny Ace, he just had a unique style. He was uh, more, I mean, his songs were so romantic. I'm sure he had hundreds and thousands of girls who really loved to listen to him sing. The way he looked, he was handsome. Uh, he sold records, and he crossed over, even on the white charts, where it was very hard to do that because most black artist songs were bought and given to white artists. So as far as his influences go, you could say he was an original. I mean, to me, when I hear Johnny Ace, I know, I know who it is. I know that his style crossed over after his death. I mean, think about Bob Dylan cutting songs, Elvis Presley cutting songs. Uh, Probably a better influence to them. So if we have to put our finger and say, well, this person sounded like Johnny Ace, Johnny Ace was unique. And that's the purpose in, in music history, the purpose of rhythm and blues and the purpose of rock and roll is to be an original. Johnny Ace was. I'll always be in love with you You're listening to Blues America Blues America Damn right Damn right We got the blues Please forgive me I've been wrong all my life. Steve, let's talk about the story, and you know what I mean. Tell me about the death of Johnny Ace. And Gary, feel free to chime in. So, the story that people know, and some form of it, the core of it is true. He's at a, 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 a Christmas Day concert in Houston Auditorium. He's uh, sharing the bill with uh, Big Mama Thornton, who had the original recording of Hound Dog and I think maybe Junior Parker may have been on the bill at the same time he's in his dressing room 
He plays Russian roulette. He loses. He blows his brains out. Well, actually, it's on his death certificate for the coroner's report. It was Russian roulette. You know, first of all, anytime anyone puts a gun to his head, a revolver, and pulls the trigger, uh, especially after pointing it at other people in the room, then it would appear to be Russian roulette. Long after I'm dead. It's a great mystery. I mean, when I started researching Johnny Ace, I heard all these stories. And I know that he had his own demons he had to deal with. But, you know, isn't that the blues? I mean, every blues artist had his own demons uh, that you had to deal with, you had to straighten it up. Johnny Ace liked to drink. I think vodka was his uh, favorite choice as far as drinking goes. And he got in a habit of carrying a small pistol that he picked up in Florida from another musician. And it was a revolver. It was a twenty two. It wasn't anything large. But... The story goes that he enjoyed riding down the road, shooting out zeros on road signs, going 90 miles an hour in his car. He had money, had some fame. But the way he died, uh, Christmas Day is not exactly a day you'd choose to commit suicide, I wouldn't think. And he was in Houston at the Civic Auditorium. And the story goes that he had finished his set and he took a break. Some stories say that he was about to go on. But what we do know, he was with Big Mama Thornton. And he was in her dressing room. Now, the gun, it's an interesting story because some sources say that Big Mama Thornton had earlier taken the gun away from him. Other sources say that night when he's in her dressing room, he was pointing it at people and pulling the trigger, pointing it at his girlfriend, pointing it at her friend, and Big Mama Thornton grabbed the gun from him. And the story goes that he grabs it back and he says, Look, it's not loaded. And he put it next to his own head, pulled the trigger, and booked his one-way ticket to rock and roll heaven. What an immortal story. Wow. Well, my personal opinion is I don't think he thought the gun was loaded. I mean, he tells Big Mama Thornton that. And it may be that the gun held seven rounds and not six. Who knows? Maybe that was a chamber he was not... A- he had not accounted for it when he put it to his head. But the police report said Russian roulette. Other sources said Russian roulette. But if you read from the coroner's report and you read from the eyewitnesses who were there, they calmly say that he just spun the gun, put it to his head, and said it's not loaded with a smile on his face, smiled and put the trigger. And Big Mama Thornton runs out of her room screaming, Johnny Ace has done killed himself. So... I think the Russian roulette thing came along as an explanation to why anyone would pick a small caliber pistol and put it next to his head and pull the trigger. It seemed like it would be much easy to believe than someone who would uh, just do it by accident. So that brings up the other thing. Did he commit suicide? Was he so depressed? Was he in, under the influence of alcohol? And, you know, there was no evidence of that either. It seems like he was pretty happy. When he put the gun to his head with a smile, he didn't seem like he was uh, deep down in the blues when he did this. Blues America. America. You're listening to Blues America. Blues America. Blues America. Blues America. Blues America. This is Blues America from PRX. I'm your host, Drew Verbis, and I'm talking to special in-studio guest, the author of The Death of Johnny Ace, Steve Bergsman, and the author of Hellhounds on Their Trail, R. Gary Patterson. So, Steve, no tragedy in the music business goes without controversy. Uh, There are many variations to the story about how Johnny Ace died. Big Mama Thornton kept Johnny Ace's gun after all of this happened, and some people ask if she was somehow involved, even if it was uh, by accident. Some people ask if there was a bullet that was put into his gun that he didn't know about. Some people claim that it was a mob hit. Others say that it was a suicide because he suffered from stage fright and depression. Um, In your book, The Death of Johnny Ace, you really explore uh, possible alternative theories that are unique and plausible. Um, Explain your theory to us and and try to explain the question of why or or how this could even happen. So that was my question. How did... 
Johnny Ace, who was at the top of his game. He was famous. He, you know, you know, another year he would have had a, his first crossover hit. He was, he was number one in in America on the R&B charts. How did he come to playing Russian roulette in his dressing room? And that was my intention of writing this book, The Death of Aunt Johnny Ace. What was his journey to that dressing room at Houston Auditorium? And I had my own, in researching Johnny Ace, I had my own theories of what really happened. And... And you know, I I probably got pretty close to it to it. So there was a, so he recorded on uh, a label that was just created out of Memphis. Oh, Duke Duke Records. I'm sorry. So Duke Records, and um, it was a local label uh, founded by a couple of white guys. Like uh, Sun Records was also founded just about the same time. And then there was this, uh, oddly enough, before Barry Gordy, there was the biggest, one of the biggest music moguls at the time was... Don Roby. Don Roby. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, out of Houston. And this guy bought Duke Records. you got to understand that this was a, a black guy out of Houston buying... A record label from white guys. It was it was pretty unusual, and so by buying Duke, he got Johnny Ace, Junior Parker, maybe a few others. So he it was a big. He had a, a huge clubs in in, in Houston, uh, and he started out uh, recording gospel acts like the Dixie Hummingbirds. So then he he he, he moved from recording gospel acts to recording rhythm and blues. But he was Barry Gordy before there was Barry Gordy. And he's not in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, probably because he had a reputation of being a bit of a gangster. And he, and he was. So he had this sort of bad reputation, but he liked music and uh, he had clubs and, and he, you know, he put people out on, on tour. He, he put his groups out on tour and, uh, and he had a record label and now he, he bought Duke Records and Johnny Ace came with it. And, but he had a habit just like Barry Gordy, of probably not treating his people too well. Matter of fact, uh, it, it sounds crude here, but it, they said he treated his his, uh, his acts like slaves. He was a black guy, and he has that off kind of awful reputation. So uh, Johnny Ace was unhappy uh, under the new ownership. So Don Roby, uh, uh, he, he may have been crude and he may have been a gangster, but he really was the first black record mogul in America. But, and I don't know, and I believe Don Roby, if not, was not in the dressing room in real life, in real life now, in the dressing room. He was, th this was his concert that he promoted and he was there. And, and Johnny Ace and Don Roby were really at loggerheads. Johnny Ace wanted out of his contract. All that conflict came to that concert and that dressing room. And in my story, that conflict, conflict is what led to Johnny Ace taking his pistol and in the end, blowing his own brains out. So I guess what you're saying in theory is if he would have not blown his brains out, he would have been released for his from his contract for doing the dare right yeah wow that's pretty heavy yeah so uh pretty much that's it i yeah. want to cry my heart out want my baby back to me got nothing but damn right damn right we got the blues more blues on our facebook and twitter More with this week's special guest when Blues America returns. But first, the Blues Break, big number one. With a new release from Alligator Records, it's Tommy Castro with Common Ground from PRX, Public Radio Exchange. The Blues Break, Blues Break, big number one. Number one, number one. 